Welcome to the stream, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to Iggy Kid on Twitch.tv. And now, introducing your host, from the 16-bit afterlife, weighing in at 273 kilobytes, assisted by the hands and voice of her mortal vessel, Iggy Kid, they are the ghost in the machine, the electric specter. El Fantasma de la Electriciedad! We are! Oh, wait. Hello! There it is. Okay, there we are. Ah, hello everybody. Happy Friday to ya. Sorry for starting like, uh an hour late, but whatever. It's all chill. I just, uh, I slept in a bit, and then I didn't have, um, time to get most of the stuff I wanted to get done. But I got my usual Friday chores done, so it all worked out in that way. And yeah, we're just gonna keep going on the Plague Night route. Uh, which one was it? Raskman and... That's the one. Plague of Shadows. Uh, I believe I already did all the cleanup stuff. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, let's deal with this guy first. Oh joy. Uh, oh, let me remember. Okay, I remember. Ah. Hope everybody is doing good out there. Uh, did y'all watch the Game Awards? I I don't really care about the awards themselves, because award shows are just marketing, right? Like, no matter how prestigious, the, if the Oscars, whatever, it's like, it's nice. Um, uh, oh, right, I can't do it. It's nice for the people who are recognized for their work, though, at the same time, they really were cutting people's speeches off so fast this year. I don't, and I, you know, maybe you could blame Christopher Judge for having such a ridiculous speech last year. But it is frustrating if it's supposed to be a celebration of devs and the games that they make that, you know, they're not actually doing that in interest of ads. But, uh, you know, what can we do? Like, it's, it's marketing. That's the, it's cross-promotion. The fact that we get anything cool out of it at all is, like, frankly, a surprise. So, I'm just glad that, unlike the Oscars, uh, they do have all the world premiere releases for different trailers and stuff. I'm particularly excited. I'm gonna get into some of the stuff that was announced, so apologies if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, Pony Island 2. Panda Circus, I think it was called. Um, which, granted, I'm not a huge fan of the original Pony Island. I do like... Uh, oh, no! Ah, I do like Inscription a lot, which was the uh, recent game from Daniel Mullins Games. Whatever, I don't need to do that nonsense. But, uh, well, let's add it, I guess. It's a good warm-up level. Even if it does have my least favorite here. Um, yeah, a Pony Island, it's like the writing is cool and the concept is neat. I just, the gameplay was like this. Yeah, it was fine, but it was like nothing special, whereas the description was like really interesting gameplay and it looks like <coughs> um, 
the uh, gameplay for Pony Island 2 is going to be interesting. So I'm pretty stoked on that. Hope y'all are too. Uh, yeah, it looks like there's more like sort of world, like actual exploration based stuff. It basically, it looks like it's only Pony Island in that it's the uh, same concept of like a game gone rogue, which is cool. I like it. And I'm excited to see because like obviously uh, Inscription was way different. So I feel like he probably learned a lot since making Inscription and I'm excited to see what he does. Um, I'm also excited, they weren't clear if they were remakes or like just modern sequels, but they're working on Golden Axe and Streets of Rage games, which they kind of had visuals for, and, Go and Crazy Taxi, which is also fun, but like not necessarily my jam. Golden Axe and Streets of Rage of the like five games they were talking about. Uh, yeah, real stoked on those. A little frustrated that they're doing a Jet Set Radio right after Bomb Rush, Super Funk or whatever it was, came out. It's like, come on, man. You know what you're doing. Uh, no. Uh, that's the guy. Oh. Oh, what the heck? Didn't come to me? That's baloney. Okay. Uh, what else? I don't know, I don't remember anything specific. Uh, my thoughts on the winners, again, don't really care, because, like, it's just marketing stuff. But, you know, it's cool uh, hearing from uh, the one guy from Baldur's Gate talking about, you know, you know, being supportive of the community, including the marginalized people. He didn't say specifically, but I know what he meant. So that was very cool, and I'm sure there's plenty of Jagoffs who would take offense to that. Awesome, hate those people. Glad they're having a bad time. Um. Uh, what else? You know, it's not. It's not specifically that, but in terms of games, since. I am gaming right now, so it seems appropriate. Uh, I, s I started supporting H Bomber Guy on Patreon. Just like two bucks, right? To get his bonus videos. Because he said that in, uh, I believe he said it in the very uh, successful video that he did on plagiarism. He has just a whole 90 minute retrospective about Mist. Like a full video essay about why Mist worked as a design. <coughs> Mist, Mist with a Y, the uh, very famous point and click adventure game, if you're not familiar. Uh, and one of the points he made I thought was pretty interesting because it's, it's, you know, it's been a lot of discourse currently, but then also it does, um, specifically relate to a point I've been making a lot in different circles I'm in that are interested in game design, whether it's because they're designers or because they're just fans of games. Uh, and that, it's the Immersive Fallacy, which I believe I've talked about in brief. The Immersive Fallacy is a logical fallacy uh, that pertains directly to video games, or, well, games in general. Um... I would even go so far as to say it pertains to all art, but it's most commonly discussed in terms of play, right? Uh, specifically intentionally designed games, because there, there's intentionally designed games, which are you know more the modern games like a video game where you set out to make a good game, right? Whereas there are, uh, what is it called, uh, like evolutionary games? are games that were not really designed by a specific person. They were just, you know, over a while, they just kind of happened, right? Like, 
different people played the games and the rules to them changed based on how people played them and all of that stuff. No. Oh, man, this is kind of tricky. Let me load up. Let me out. Let me out. Okay. I don't care about this guy. I just want out. Okay. Um. Okay, I just gotta be careful with those spikes. Ah. Hold on. Crap, I don't remember what all these mean. Lob, that's the one I want. That's the one that goes up. Okay, there we go. Ah, damn it! Ah, these water physics are tricky. Okay. But, uh, yeah, that's just an aside. But basically, it's the... The logical fallacy goes that games are supposed to be realistic. Or that games are striving to be realistic, right? Uh, I would say, if you want a deeper explanation of this, go watch, uh, How About This Game? Uh, Immersion? That's usually how I look it up. It's by Barry Kramer when he was still working for Game Grumps as an editor. It's on their channel, Grump Out. Um, and yeah, it is a fantastic little 12-minute uh, essay, really, about the immersive fallacy and just immersion in general. Like, it's mostly about immersion, but it's specifically about, like, the way... The kind of misguided way that game devs approach immersion, which is, again, it's to try and make games more realistic. Which is understandable, right? Because especially now, we can make games that look so beautiful and so close, and we're like, okay, that's more immersive, right? To be real. But... Uh, the reality is that games, the f thing that makes a game and not just real life is representation, or as I usually put it, abstraction. Like, no matter how realistic a game is, there's still a level where the thing that you're, like, say your avatar of whatever kind. Like, if World of Warcraft was 100% realistic, you jacked into it like it's, uh, like Ready Player One or something, right? Which is usually the example. Because people seem to think that's what they want. Because from uh, an outside perspective, that seems really fun, right? To just be just in the game. And it's like, yeah, on a visceral level, that would be neat. But, um, the problem as, uh, I don't remember who it was, but a game designer has this great long, well, not even long, it's a pretty short rant that was at the Game Developers Conference, I believe? How am I gonna get through this situation? Hmm. Oh, there it went. Nice. Uh, that was basically like, we have, we have representative things, right? Like, the, the, his example is the word bear. We have the word bear, and it's designed to represent a bear, and it tells you many things, like there is a bear here. But if that word were more realistic and less representative, less abstracted, and you gave it like teeth and claws and it could maul you like a real bear, uh, that would not make it better. In fact, it would make it not only worse, but just functionally useless, because if it's mostly used as a warning, and now it is itself a danger, then you would never use it. Damn it. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the very often, as I'm talking to people who are into game design, or at least into games, they'll make some kind of argument like this 
everything is better because it's more immersive, because it's more realistic? And the answer is no. Being more immersive, being more realistic does not make something more immersive. In reality, while there are many things that can suck you into a game, most of them are going to be mechanical because there's the flow state as described by Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. Mi Mikhail, I don't remember his specific name. It's very European, and I specifically I want to do a video essay that meant that references this guy just so that I can be the only video essay where I say his name correctly and don't make a joke about how you can't say his name correctly. But that means I have to actually figure out how to say it correctly. <laughs> but yeah, that's always the joke that people put in essays when they reference him. Is like I don't know how to say his name. It's like. I mean, yeah, but you could learn. Come on, man. Don't be, don't be lazy. Respect the guy. He's got some great, great works. I, I assume it's a fella. I don't actually know. Um, because everybody just uses the uh, the name. But yeah. Um. But uh, there's the. The concept of the flow state, right? Which is that there's a point, there's a point where a player hits. Uh, what is it? Uh, there's a point where a player hits a sweet spot, basically, of um, being challenged. Uh, uh, there's basically a sweet spot of challenge, right, generally, is what it's gonna be, where it's, you know, if it's something is too, uh, is too challenging, then it becomes frustrating. If it's not challenging enough, then it becomes boring, right? And part of the challenge is just learning the game, right? In fact, I would say, um... Figuring out, figuring out how to play the game, like, literally just, like, you know, how do you run around? How do you move? That is, like, an early heuristic and an early form of challenge. And then after that, it becomes, okay, how do I strategize now? How do I be good at this game, not just adequate at it? And that would be the next level. And as it goes on, you have to... Be, the, the, the tricky thing is you can find something that's satisfying at the beginning, but if it doesn't retain that as people get better at it because once you're um right it's it's a graph of skill and challenge so your skill will go up over time and so the challenge has to rise to match it otherwise you'll lose interest and that's you know a big problem in tabletop gaming because often games you know after three four five plays you figured out everything about the game. It's no longer challenging, and it becomes boring. It's, uh, as the Geek Knights put it, it's a solved game. You figured out the puzzle. It's no longer interesting. That building your heuristic tree of just, like, learning what the game is about, whether it's strategy or just, like, you know, basic utility, has run out. It's no longer... There's no more leaps on that tree. Ah... Uh, Ooh, careful. Um. So. That's the thing, is that mechanically, that is when you're immersed, is when you're in the flow state. Often people think that it's because of, you know, all of the graphics and stuff, but actually, the reality is that the, the, the graphics, the music, all of the presentation is, at least in, you know in, in uh, games that are well-crafted, well-considered, will support that. It will support the mechanics, it will support the gameplay in a way. Um, it won't just be a matter... Oh, jeez. It won't just be a matter of something looking nice, looking real. Because if it just looked like real life... Oh, jeez. If it just looked like real life, why would you play it? You know? And, yeah, there's... There is stuff to be said about realism, you know? You, you can watch a movie that's literally about real life. It could be someone's actual life. And it's often very interesting. 
but part of what's interesting about it is that you're exploring something that you don't normally. So even if it's visually real life, it's actively emulating real life. Uh, you know, even like a documentary, like the interesting thing is how they decide to present it. There's still a storytelling aspect to it. So similarly, um, you know, it, it, media is generally about exploring things and it can be about exploring different challenges or it's about like getting information. As Mike Selinker said, uh, and I'm still wrapping my head around this because it's a more recent thing that I've been interested in, but um, what he said is that you might think that you play games because they're fun. You don't. You play games because they're work. You enjoy them because they are different from the other work that you have to do. Right? And obviously that's, you know, an abrasive, inflammatory way to put it, but I hope you see his point the way that I'm seeing it, which is that... Damn it. Um... I think that's one thing I... That one reason I don't like this movement system as much as Shovel Knights is because... It feels so defeating when you enter a position where you, like, can't get out of it anymore. Like, especially in this level where you're just slowly drifting into doom. It's like, man, that... Oh, that feels bad. I don't know. Although, I'm sure... See, like, right there. What am I supposed to... I guess I could do the, the bomb jump. But it's... I don't know how helpful that would be for me. It's just, yeah, the bomb jump is, like, a little too wild. It's not really unpredictable, but it feels uh, so strong that it, it makes me nervous, you know? Uh. Um, so, in that same way... Any time that you engage in recreation, you're doing some kind of work, even if it's, you know, busy work like grinding, or more specific work like puzzle solving, or, like, within a game, literally, like, building something, if it's Minecraft or The Sims or something like that, or, you know, Stardew Valley, you're literally running a farm, one of the hardest jobs, in, like, known to man throughout history, engaging in agriculture, and you're doing it because, in that case, it is fun because it's different from what you normally do. Or like a Euro Truck Simulator, Power Wash Simulator. Like these are jobs you could do, but you don't want to because that's not as fun. But it is still more fun than what you normally do. And thus it is what we call fun. So my larger point here, because there's a lot to be said about this, but effectively, I think my problem with a lot of people who are armchair game designers, right? And often that's me as well. I won't deny that. Um, but, uh, you know, people who play a lot of games and thus think that they understand game design very well. And it's like, they don't... They're not terrible at game design. Hello? Oh, cool. Uh, they're not necessarily like terribly uh, well okay I won't say that they're not terribly game design I'll say they are generally misinformed about what it is that works in a game right which is to say their idea hmm, I'm getting this sticky territory here you are allowed to enjoy art and that includes games for, uh, any way you like for any reason that you want, right? There's genuinely, there's no... Like, I will say in some situations maybe you're enjoying it in a way that you're missing out. But that doesn't mean that you're doing it wrong. There's no wrong way to, like, uh, do recreation. If you are finding enjoyment in the activity, then you're doing it right. Right? Um, 
Uh, the, often there are ways to do it that are even better that I would recommend. You know, like uh, the, the usual example to me is when people start house ruling a board game after only playing it a couple times. Like, keep playing it. Play it the regular way. Like, literally, I see people just... God damn it. I see people immediately just like, uh, how do I fix this? How do I rebalance this? And my point is like, just keep playing it. It was probably unbalanced that way for a reason. Like, don't just assume that the designer made a mistake. And granted, in this day and age of like, kind of sloppy Kickstarter games, you're not wrong to assume that maybe they, maybe they messed up. Because it happens more and more often. We're definitely in a point where, you know, quality control is up to the designer. And that's, yeah, that's not, that's, there's, uh, and when I say problematic, I don't mean like, you know, societally problematic. I mean like, literally just like, it is kind of an issue to have, to uh, do your own quality control. You need to have a third party doing that, a third party that you can trust to be harsh with you, to be real and honest, um, to make sure that you're like getting feedback that will actually result in uh, improvement, right? But uh, where was that? Right. Um, just like trust that they they knew what they were doing for a bit. If you can play it ten times and you're still having an issue, analyze if it's a problem with the game or it's just not a game that you would like. Right? Like the big thing I always see is Cole Worley's games, some which are some of my favorite games. I he is my favorite designer. But, so often, uh, players will go on the forums and be like, this is super imbalanced, there's king making happening constantly in Root or Oath, and it's like, they're saying it like it's a problem, like that, like, it's a, it's, you know, it's a king making problem, but, uh, it's not. In fact, in, in the case of at least Oath, and definitely Root as well, it's intentional. He wants there it to be highly political and have a great deal of king-making. Like, that was an, in, an intention of the design from... I, well, I don't know if it was from the beginning, but, like, it is one of the core guiding principles of a lot of his games. And, you know... I personally am frustrated that people just assume that he messed up rather than taking some time to think like, well, why would it be like that? And the answer is because you didn't, you're not as clever as you think you are, basically. And there is in fact, um, a lot more happening here than you may realize. Eh. Son of a... Eh. I get these things. Lobby, maybe? Oh, yeah, there we go. I wasn't sure if that coin would be a problem. Eh. Crap, 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 crap! Ugh. No! 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 Ah. Uh. Okay. So yeah, I would say that's misguided. It's coming from a place of misunderstanding and being misinformed about what the game is trying to do. And sometimes that'll be for specific designs. And sometimes that will be for games in general. And that's how the immersive fallacy happens. People misunderstand what the goals of games in general are, let alone specific games. And if those people get into game design, sometimes they make kind of misguided games. And that's fine. Oh jeez, my webcam is like right in the way so I can't tell where the platform ends. Like, 
As I was saying last stream, you don't have to be good at art to engage with art. In fact, some of the best art, I personally would say, is some stuff that's really unskilled. Like, you know, stuff that is, uh, not necessarily concerned with, you know, being, um, polished or highly academically informed. And some of that art is amazing. Some of it's not as great, and, you know, there's a lot to be said, but that's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but... Where am I going with all of this? Basically... Um, hey, Chester! Trade you up. Oh, there we go. That's the thing. Okay, that's the thing I need for the uh, okay, situation. How do I get in here again? Oh, I got to bust it open. Right. Oh, we're going down. We're going down now. I guess that makes sense. But yes, back to my original point with that uh, that sort of long primer on what the immersive fallacy is. But, uh, yeah, in what I find interesting, because of going back to that guy with the, the bear example, uh, his other example is basically if you had, if you had a perfect simulation of reality, right? Full on Ready Player One, you're just standing in a real place, your brain can't, it's the Matrix, you can't tell the difference. Um, and you're standing on some kind of beach, uh... With, like, you know, sand that feels like sand. You can smell the, the tide. Uh, what's the game? What do you do? Other than, I mean, you basically just do real life, right? And so if you want it to have a game, you've got to, like, use what's in there to make a game. Like, it's Gary's Mod, basically. Like, you have to take all the stuff. All it is is tools to make an actual game. It's not a game on its own. Um... Kagoosh. Uh... So yeah, you would have to sit there and just use like the rocks and the, the stones and the sand and make like a chessboard or something. And look at that! You did all of this work to make something perfectly realistic and we're back to square one. You have to, you have to make a game still. Like, realism is not a game, and realism does not... Realism does not make something a game, despite being digital. And it does not say anything about the game, nor does it do anything for the game other than make it realistic. Like, it doesn't make it a better game, it doesn't make it a better experience, it just makes it a realistic experience. And I would say, personally, I'm trying not to have realism, because once again, I'm trying to have a different kind of work. If I wanted to just be in the real world, I would just be in the real world. You can go outside and have adventures IRL anytime, you know? The reason you like something like Skyrim is because it's not the real world. It's not realistic, it's fantasy. And it's like, yeah, there are realistic aspects to it, but a lot of it is still very much representative and abstracted. When you, di when you chop wood, it doesn't make you sit there and like figure out how to angle the axe and do all that. No, you just hit a button and you do the wood because they know that it would be boring to have like a full system around something so basic. So they abstracted it out to make it better for you. And so by ignoring that and being like, I wish it was more realistic, you're kind of defeating the, the intent of the, uh, the author. And obviously the author's intent is not 100% always a big deal that you should always take into account, but it is important to take into account, you know, what, um, what the form is trying to do. And it's not trying to be realistic. So, now that I've said all that, the thing I was actually going to talk about in the H-Bomber video, 
merch is great. I definitely recommend y'all uh, support for $2 on Patreon to HBOM so that you can see it as well, because it's very fun. Um, let me get some water. Is that mist works because it's so... It can only have so many objects. So, it, uh, I believe I'm at the end here, right? Yes. Treasure Knight. What's the matter, Plague Knight? Alchemy business slowing down. Here to make some coin. Where are the orders? Coffers running dry. Can't you just synthesize all the fool's gold you want? Ha! Good guess. But no, it's something far more important than mere gold. More important than gold? Now you're just being ridiculous. Get out of here, you bottom feeder. Ooh, your essence is showing. <laughs> I hope you don't mind if I help myself. Um. Uh, but yeah, the uh, the thing is, a lot of modern games are very pretty and very more realistic, right? And the big discourse has been like, you know, in Resident Evil. It's annoying that they have to have... People say, I don't necessarily agree with this, but people say it's annoying that there have to be a bunch of yellow tape over stuff that you can interact with so you know that you can interact with it. Um, which I disagree. I think that that's a good idea, but I think that H-Bomb makes a good point that it's solving a problem that they introduced by trying to be more realistic, right? We've got five essences. We're getting there. Let's relax and let the dynamo decanter do its thing. Hee, but a watched pot never boils. Sure, but right now something else has caught my eye. This step takes concentration. You must drop the essence in slowly. It's very... Why don't you come over here and help me unjam this lever? The pivot seems to be stuck. It'll take two people to wrench it free. Come closer. Don't be shy. I'm right here. Oh, now I'm... Nervous about it. It won't budge. Put your hand over mine. Is this a trap? The forces of darkness reign no longer, for I, Percy, have fixed the power. How's it going? Yeesh, that's a nasty stuck lever. Need a hoof with that? No, you're good. Fair enough. I'll be in the other room doing science. Well, so much for that. Uh, where were we before? Oh, oh yeah. You look like you lost a fight with a pond. Ocean, actually. How'd you go liberate the essence of avarice? Nice place he's got down there. I never understood what he saw in gold. Just make it from sawdust and mouse skulls. Some people do things the hard way. <laughs> Let's do some work. Oh, by the way, take a swig of this health potion I made for you. Maybe it'll help. Nice. So, what are we working on? Research. Uh, do I have that? Nope. 38. Oh, man. Let's shop. Let's see. Ooh, that could be good. Huh. Uh, I'll get this one for sure. Okay. Now I can do clean up. Um, yep, let's get him. Oh, I could have done that. Well, whatever. Bring these in. Um, but yeah, the thing that I'm, I think with it is, uh, let's see. So yes, the, the yellow tape and like Resident Evil games, um, the issue with it is not what people think it is. The issue they think is that it makes it look silly and it makes it look more video game. -y. The real problem is that because the worlds are so detailed and so full of things that you can't interact with in the interest of, you know, uh, looking more realistic, right? Oh, crap. 
I did it wrong. Uh, that it's hard to tell what you can interact with. So to solve the problem of players not being certain what is interactable, they, crap, they created this aesthetic of, you know, clearly highlighted things that you can interact with. And it wasn't a problem before, right? Because games couldn't do that, whether it's, you know, miss, as H-Bomb said, um, or, uh, Ocarina of Time, I was thinking about that. In the higher definition forms of Ocarina, you can, whoop, hey, aha, I saw that coming. Oh crap, that's not where I wanted it. Let's wait for that to load back up. Ah, crap. I did it too high up. Uh, you can tell that actually most of the world isn't real. Like, even within uh, the game code, it's not real. It's literally just... Um, it's textures. Like, they're just flat. Like, when you walk into a room in Ocarina, it's just a flat texture, often. It's hard to do. Uh, okay. What the fu- I did the button. <sighs> okay. Um, I hate that there's all of these. Like, I get it, they're trying to make you do the bomb burst more, but genuinely, it's so frustrating to have something that I can just barely not jump over. That sucks. I hate that. Like, that really just makes me dislike this movement system more, because you're literally... You're having to insist to me that it's a more interesting system than it is by forcing me to engage with it, even when I shouldn't need to. Right here, that's good. That feels good, because I can just instinctually do that, but then... If I try and do that, and I end up uh, not being able to... Fuck! Come on, man! I hate that! I hate that you can't- that if you can somehow make it too high up to use. That's annoying. Uh, but yeah, that's frustrating, because I get it. It means you're trying to force me to engage with your movement system, and I get it. But also, maybe just make your movement system more intuitive so I use it anyways? Like, I shouldn't be looking at this and think, can I get over that, or can't- am I gonna have to do, like, some kind of nonsense with the bomb jump, right? If- if it's gonna be something I have to bomb jump over, it should be, like, obvious. It should be, like, really, like, you have to really, it should be, like, a huge area. You, like, if you don't bomb jump, it'll be like, well, obviously I can't make it. Um, let's do this. But having, yeah, these ones where it's, like, it's so close to being able to, uh, double jump, and then they're like, no, actually it's a bomb jump thing. It's like, come on, man, that sucks. <sighs> in general, that's my point. In a lot, of a lot of games will do that, where they're like, here's a special movement thing that you can do. So we're gonna have spaces where you can, like, just barely knock it over so that you have to do the thing. And it's like, I don't like that. Make it so that it's obvious I can't get over the thing. Like, make a freaking cliff or something where it's like, okay, I have to bomb jump because it's clearly way too high. If I have to figure out that minute thing of, like, can I double jump over it or can't I, I'm just annoyed, you know? I don't want to make those kinds of, like, choices in the heat of the moment. Granted, I can't remember if I've had to in the heat of the moment yet. This, is, this right here, this is not the heat of the moment, so... I suppose it's tolerable, but I shouldn't have to tolerate things in your game. 
Like, I just, I don't get it. What is the, what is the purpose of forcing me, to, like, all it does is make me annoyed at the movement system more because I'm being forced to engage with it at times where it is not really necessary. Maybe the consideration was, uh, I don't know, maybe it was something in playtesting, or maybe it was just, like, a consideration for a problem that is no longer clear because it's been solved by that? I'm not sure. But, uh, yeah, I find it a little frustrating from a playing perspective. Oh, come the fuck! Yeah, stuff like that! Where it's it's just like a s mm, it's just not clear whether it's going to be a double jump or not, or whether it's going to have to be a bomb jump. Like if you have two different movement options that are so vastly different in their utility, then your challenges should be clear, right? Like, it should be clear which tool is needed. Unless, you know, maybe it's a situation where it's like, yeah, it's a huge challenge, so it's like, you're not certain, and it's like, oh, maybe I can make this, maybe... Like, those are fun problems. If it's literally just, like, a regular jump that I'm trying to do to survive or progress through a basic area, uh, I don't want to have to do those calculations, personally. Yeah, but uh, yeah, basically, like all the all the areas in Ocarina of Time, all the things that you can interact with in Ocarina of Time, um, are objects themselves. And in you know HD re-releases, it's way more obvious which ones are interactable and which ones aren't because you can totally tell what's a flat image and what isn't. So that I find a little interesting, and yeah, that that in that way, it's a lot easier to tell because they literally didn't have space for superfluous stuff. Everything that they decided to include because literally disk space was so so constricted had to be important. You didn't add stuff just necessarily just for fun, although you could. It would just be a really big decision. Whereas now, it's like there's so much space, there's so much power in our machines that you can make a game that looks like, you know, Resident Evil 8. And it looks incredible, but then it's like there's so much stuff there that being able to tell what is interactable is uh, difficult. So by making it more detailed, more realistic, the game it received a problem. It received a usability problem that was not an issue before. And it inherited it from uh, this this attempt at realism, and I just find that really interesting. That the immersive fallacy holds true, even in good games where they've solved the problem. It's like the problem only cropped up because um, because of the immersive fallacy and the attempt at making games less representational then you had to find a new way to represent things that were of great importance and to highlight them. It's interesting stuff. I, I mean, I, I love game design. Um, and yeah, I just, I think game design is really, it's just fascinating when you see things like that where you're, uh, you're having to work through stuff that wasn't even problems before. And I mean, that's also a big thing. Even moving from two-dimensional to three-dimensional, because moving to three-dimensional uh, made things more realistic by a full dimension. And thus, people had to do more to make it clear. Like, there were so many new problems that arise because arose, excuse me. There were so many new problems that arose because the realism at play made things less abstracted, make them uh, bigger, as Aaron Hansen put it in his sequelitis video. 
the more, um, I'm trying to remember the first thing he says. Uh, the more, the closer you get things analogous to reality, the more you have to stipulate on them, right? Like, uh, in the original Zelda, a bat is to your left, or above you, or to the right, or down. Very clear. But, in Ocarina, a bat could be anywhere in 3D space. Y and, like, how do you deal with that, other than to make the bat not move realistically? But then people might find that hokey, and it's like, well, I think that that would probably make for, you know, maybe better. But then maybe you just have to expand on the systems that involve bats, expand the combat, you know? Which they tried not to do. When they m do the combat, I'm getting very distracted at this point, but it's important to me. Uh, when they do the combat, it's Z-targeting. What does Z-targeting do? It turns it back into two dimensions. It makes you focus in so that you are moving two-dimensionally around your target. And yeah, the target's going up and down, but it doesn't matter because you are focused on it. If you use, like, a projectile like the arrows or the slingshot or the boomerang, it will go straight there. So what you've done is you've turned it into two-dimensional. You're moving on the ground two-dimensionally, and whatever you attack, you will be attacking two-dimensionally. It takes the third dimension out to make the combat work because the combat still has to work in two dimensions. And a lot of 3D games do this. Even Dark Souls still does this stuff. Or Kingdom Hearts, or all of this stuff, because they recognize that actual three-dimensional combat is very difficult to program and to, like, uh, participate in. So they had to simplify it in a way that didn't feel simplified. Man, I want to... I almost want to remake my sequelitis video because I have so many bigger ideas about game design than I used to. But no, it's not worth it. I'll just probably reference Ocarina of Time more because I've looked at it so much. I don't think Ocarina of Time is a bad game. I think it did an incredible job at one of the most difficult problems the game industry ever faced, which is, you know, adapting two-dimensional gameplay into three dimensions. But... It is still one of the early examples of that, and it, there was still a lot to be improved on. And it has been improved on since, but, you know, we can't deny, like, there are things there that are sloppy. You know? Or if not sloppy, like, they just hadn't figured out yet. Like, there were still problems that they just kind of glossed over in a way that makes it easier to ignore, but that, you know, doesn't remove the problem. Uh, right. Musk. Okay, okay, um, I think I have enough to get a new suit, so let's go do that. Hey, Trouble Man. Is it you? Somebody has, like, a suit for me, right? Uh, no, I don't want that. Hold on, how's this go? Oh, I like that. Oh, let's, I do want to switch it. That. How's the Hall of Champions go? What's up? Blink not- I mean, uh, welcome, uh, patron. Nothing suspicious happening here. Eh. Eh. There he is! The Order's Alchemist. Get him. You can't beat everyone. Oh, but I can, sir. Sir, I can. I see. Okay, let's, uh... 
Let's switch back to the balance casing. Also, let's just go with black powder. Man, it's every time. Every time. I just go back to the basic one. Whoops. Oh. You can destroy the, uh... Interesting. Wonder yeah, if anybody recognizes anybody in the patron. Like I know Aaron Hansen's in there. And uh I think Simon I've spotted Simmentos Ken. Though I don't know what happened to Simmentos Ken. I hope he ended up being just chill and irrelevant and not, you know. A gross boy, like so many of those guys that fell, you know, ended up falling from grace. Mia. Uh, sure someone could tell me. I know Prokarib isn't cool. Um, still working through Dream not being cool. Oh my god. Anybody fall in that situation? Ooh, I'm not gonna get into it here. But there's, there's a lot of horrible stuff that he's been up to. Oh, that's neat. I'm turning the lights back off. Whereas, uh, Shuffle Knight was turning them on. Is this supposed to be a challenge with these guys? They ain't doing much to me. Whoa. Whoa. And then, yeah, I knew this was here. See what I mean? Maybe that was easier to go by in Shuffle Knight, but like the Shovel Knight route, but, like, man, that's annoying. It's just the tiniest few pixels. Why's it gotta be in my way? Man, I don't know. Oh, boy. But, yeah. I don't know, what is, anybody got opinions about, uh, the Game Awards or the ramble I just had about the essence of abstraction in game design? Because there's so much more, you could write a whole book on it. In fact, I would say any book on game design is about it, whether it realizes it or not. That's, that's a whole other discussion. Um, Eh, no, give me that. Oh, I missed that. I don't know, man. Video games. Games in general. I don't have as much interest in making video games, though there are interesting things to be done in video games. To me, I prefer tabletop because it has to be even more abstracted. And there's so many more usability um, considerations. And like usability and rulebook writing are my like favorite parts of game design in general. So it just makes sense to uh, work in a format that still uses rulebooks. Because video games don't use rulebooks. They just use uh, in-game tutorials. Which, I mean, yeah. Sequelitis talked all about, you know, how frustrating it is that every tutorial has to be some hand-holding nonsense, you know, like you're in a, in a classroom rather than in an interactive medium where they can kind of just show you how to do, they can basically trick you into, like, this is where that old talk, games are mind control, like, this is what it was talking about is like you can basically trick your player into learning how to play your game through a variety of different techniques that basically cause them to do the thing that they need to without even realizing it like they do the thing they need to and then you know they already did the thing and so when they need to do the thing they're like oh yeah i know how to do that thing 
that is clever design. And I would say is something that all designers should challenge themselves to. Though, obviously it is still a challenge, so anybody who doesn't, I can't blame them that much. I would say, like, why are you making a game if you're not wanting to challenge yourself? That's like the whole point of art. But, you know, money, I guess. But, like, indie games don't really make that much money. They can't charge, like, any real reasonable rate for, for games. And only, like, a few indie games really pop off anymore. Like, they all do okay, at least. But only some of them do really good. Yeah, I think that guy with the, the like, hood there, that might have been sitting in the post thing. I don't know. I never watched his stuff, so I don't really know anything about him. I remember he was a part of Polaris before that all went went down the tubes. I mean, Maker Studios in general, right? Yep. MCNs! Anybody remember MCNs? The multi-creator network thing? They're not really a thing anymore because it became clear with Maker. Oh, sweet, I did it. We surrender. Please stop your tech. Hey, let me get that gold. Now! Ah, dip. Oh, I still have stuff I wanted to get. Okay, well, whatever. But yeah, it turns out that they were adding, giving creators nothing of value and uh, taking absurd amounts of... They were basically working as... They were acting as agencies, not providing any of the benefits of an agency, and taking a ridiculous cut of people's profits. And that sucks. And that's bad. I'm glad that they're not really a thing anymore. Like, the idea of a multi-creator network is actually that people collaborate and help each other, you know, like a community. But then companies came in and just, you know, took that idea and turned it into something completely unrelated. I swear, there's gotta be a guy... Somebody sold me this... This, uh situation I'm wearing now. Who did that? Is it oh hello? Oh okay. Oh it was the troutful I remember. The trout it's one of the I cores. That's the one I want. Good, good, good. Uh, what do we want to do? We could do Holy Knight. This is probably... Let me walk in to see what we need for it. Fast enough. Okay. Zoom, it's a polar night thing. Since it's uh, icy. And every time. Oh, yeah, my movements seem a little bit heavier. But not getting knocked around is a massive, massive benefit, because the thing that kills me the most is getting knocked around, and I get why they included it. That's a classic, classic SNES kind of thing. Uh, but it is still very annoying. Oh, wait a minute. That's interesting. So if you're just barely under, like I was complaining about, I guess you can do a, you can do a hop up and that. Yeah, you can do the bomb to get a little bit of extra air. Hmm. Well, that's an interesting utility. Uh, let's switch to the bait bomb. No, I don't have room. Uh. Right. 
that. Keep that. Whip. Okay. There it is. There it is. Oh yeah, and I'm still working on that thing I said I'm gonna announce uh, next week. Which my stream next week will probably be, you know, uh, shorter because it's gonna be me doing all of my at home. We do a toy day, as they say in Animal Crossing. Uh, normally we do it on the solstice, which is the 21st, but we're gonna do uh, we're gonna do next weekend because that's when my roommate's kids gonna be over. And it's going to be right before my trip, so that's pretty much the last time when we're all going to be able to hang out and uh, exchange gifts. I already got all my gifts for my roommates and my roommate's kid. Uh, still got to get some gifts for the rest of my family. Yeah, it's tricky because there's at least two. My roommate has a December birthday. And my grandmother has a uh, December birthday, so I gotta get both of them two gifts around this time. And it's like, man, I need a wa I need a bit to like think up another interesting gift. I don't know. Maybe I'll come up with something to uh, some kind of crafted gift. That could be good. Ah, oh, dang it! Cause they always say to make something right, but I'm always like, ah. I don't know, something, maybe it's just my lack of self-confidence, but something feels arrogant of being like, haha, my thing that I made is good enough to be, is good enough to be a gift for you. Don't you like it? And it's like, I don't know, something, it's not on par with, uh, uh-oh, uh-oh. It's not like on par with, uh, uh -oh with, like, giving somebody a picture of yourself, but it, I don't know, it feels like it has a similar vibe to me, personally. Not that, that's the thing, though, is if somebody else did that for me, I'd be like, heck yeah, I want whatever you got for me, that's cool. Um, but, I don't know, it's just, when I think about myself doing it, I'm like, ew, this is so, so gosh. Like, literally, if anybody else did it, I'd be like, heck yeah, it's awesome that you did that, and if they did it for me, I'd be like, oh my god. That's so cool. Look at you being all creative and thrifty. Whoa. I always find it interesting what people label as thrifty versus uh, cheap. Because really the only difference is whether or not you think it was worth saving on. like if it's something you think you shouldn't be send, saving money on you'd call it cheap but if you if it's something that you think you shouldn't it's a good idea to save on well then it's thrifty it's clever it's like i think it says more about our you know our personal value towards the thing than the actual person who's doing the thing cuz to like to them that was the the value of it like, the value they were able to get, what they ended up paying, what they ended up doing, that's how much it's worth to them. That's how, like, economics works. So, it's just, it's literally calling someone cheap is just societal pressure to make them spend more. And, really, not even spend more, just align to your values in terms of economics. And that's... That's not cool. Especially considering calling someone cheap assumes that they can afford it. I don't know. It's also like if it's affecting someone else, they'll come in. But then again, that's a value thing. Like, you know, uh, something for a gift for someone else. It's like, if you cheap out on that, then yeah, you're seen as cheap because there's value in uh, being generous. God damn it. Ah, uh, yeah. 
Yep, this is most assuredly my least favorite of these four campaigns. It's just, like I was saying with the flow state earlier, the challenge is just a little too high. The movement system is not, it's like, it's cool in concept, but it's clearly designed to fit, um, to fit into the model of like what they had already created for his boss fight from the Shovel Knight campaign. And while, yes, god damn it, while they were designing Shovel Knight, they knew that they were going to be making this campaign. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if they considered whether or not it'd be something that'd be fun for the player or not. I like to think they were, but it's hard to say. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to skip this. I don't care. It's just becoming a... Uh, uh, point. I don't want it. I don't want it. I just want to keep going. I don't know how long I'm going to go for tonight. I'll probably take a break after I finish this level. We're pretty close to the end, so I could finish things off tonight if I have the energy. It's also like, I feel like I should chill out some too, because you know, it's been a stressful week. I had a lot of work to do. As you can probably tell as well, my voice is a little crunchy because the weather keeps yo-yoing back and forth. I hate it. Like, I would rather it just stay hot than to get cold and just not quite cold enough. Because we keep having... The thing that keeps happening is it's cold for a couple days. We turn off the AC and, you know, we open the window so things can cool down. And then suddenly it's back up to not quite hot enough to turn the AC back on. But in my room it's hot because I have a south-facing window. So I'm just getting roasted in the sun all day. It's like 80 degrees in my room, whereas it's only like 70 in the rest of the house. And it's super damp and humid because we got the windows all open and it's not that cold, so it's not dry weather. So I have to run my humidifier, which warms things up. It's pumping out like hot air that it's used to take all of the humidity out. So now I'm having to pump hot air, like a not quite a heater, but like, hot air into my space that's already too hot. And it's worse than the summer. Ah, it's awful. I hate it. It's finally, like, cool now where it's not a problem, but now it's like my voice is always affected whenever the seasons change. So it keep the fact that it keeps yo-yoing back and forth like that, like, every, every week it's like that. It's, like, cool for a few days, then warm again for a few days. So it's just playing hell on my voice because I can't tell if it's, like, are we adjusting... Like, my body can't adjust to, is it going to be humid? Is it going to be cold? Is it going to be what? Is it going to be this or that? It's like, it can't figure it out. And so it's, I just get croaky and awful. And it's very frustrating. Oh, can I not use this? Hmm. Ooh, that was very close. Didn't hit the hit the jump fast enough. Bleh. That's something something I need people to understand about acoustics is you can literally change acoustics by holding stuff around your mouth. Like just now, I was scratching my back, so my uh, mouth was up in my elbow, and as you can hear, the audio changed because even though I'm talking directly to you. Parts of the frequencies are being blocked by my arm and my jacket, and parts of, um, you know, parts of the things, uh, parts of the acoustics aren't coming through. Parts of the voice aren't coming through, so if, as soon as I lower my elbow, 
Here we go. I'm going to start raising my elbow up as I speak, and you can hear it slowly change in audio as I do that. And here, it's I'm not. there's nothing between me and the microphone. My mouth is still unblocked, and now it sounds more muffled. Or you can just, like, you know, just put your jacket over your mouth, and it's like you're only slightly muffled. Or you can just put your hands on either side of the microphone, and that changes the sound of things, because now it's directing it straight to the mic rather than just out to the entire room or even up top. That's why when you're recording, if you have like a hat with a brim, you're supposed to turn it around because it can affect the sound of the microphone. If I'm holding my hand where a hat brim would be at, it changes the audio, not a ton, but just slightly enough so that you can tell the difference. Just uh, a neat little trick for y'all at home who use microphones to think about. And I'm going to uh, marker that, although I haven't really been doing my markers for a uh, while. I've been busy. You know, y'all can clip something if you think it's cool. I'd love for you to do that. But also, uh, it's not a huge priority for me. Because it's mostly a marketing thing. Like, as I was saying, uh, someone was like, you know, how can you tell what to put in an expansion and I was like for me I don't like making money is important because you need to be able to pay to make more games but for me I don't care about making money as a first and foremost thing so if the expansion is just adding stuff that I don't care about to service somebody who might buy stuff that doesn't really matter to me at all so Similarly, uh, ah, son of a mm. similarly, stu marketing stuff, like using highlights as marketing, is not really something I care about as a streamer now because I don't really care about making money anymore. Like, I was like, maybe I could do that, that would be really cool to do full time streaming, but I'm like, no. If I luck out and get viral enough that I could do that, obviously I'm not gonna, you know, throw it away. That would be foolish, but it's like, it's a ton of work to become a full-time streamer, and it's really, you have to do a specific style of streaming for it to actually happen generally, and, you know, obviously you could get it to happen eventually, regardless. You know? But the reality is the people who I like the most as streamers are the people who are not just trying to be entertainers or trying to get fame. And as much as a lot of streamers are like, oh yeah, I'm not doing it for the fame or the popular or any of that. It's like, you, you are, actually. A lot of times they are. And there's nothing wrong with that. I would say it's annoying that they don't want to admit to themselves that that's their goal. But, um, yeah. And that's the thing, is I'll admit, if I have the opportunity to go full-time and do this, I will. But I don't want to do it if it means I have to do, you know, all sorts of stupid sponsorship stuff. And ad reads, and I have to do, like, a million, like, meme explosion effects or whatever nonsense. Like, I've done so much work to make this an appealing thing to look at, this stream. I don't think... Caving into stuff that I personally have zero interest in doing, both in setting up and just like, like the meme explosion, it's like, it's neat, but it detracts from the point of my streams. My streams, I want to be sort of a playground for my performance and a place for me to, you know, celebrate games. Similar to like early Let's Plays, they weren't just like, look at me goofing off and performing. They were, hey, here's a game I really love. Check it out. You know, especially in the days when it wasn't easy to get a bunch of games. In fact, a lot of people credit um, credit Let's Plays on Something Awful forms with being a big part of why the Danganronpa series found traction uh, in the U.S. Because a lot of people couldn't get access to it. A lot of people didn't have a, a Vita, which is what it was mostly on. So, yeah, it was through Let's Plays that, you know, 
there was more eyes in that. Um, just got to time it out. Whoops. Ah. That's our... Um, so yeah, I don't want to be a streamer who's just doing nothing but trying to appeal to an audience so that they subscribe, so they do this. Like, I'd love it if you guys do that. But it's... I'm going to make a stream that I am proud of, that I'm happy making. And if people resonate with that, great. If they don't, I didn't really, like... It says callous to... It sounds callous to be like, if they don't resonate with that, I don't care about them. But it's like, it's more that I don't care if they don't resonate with it, you know? Like, I'm not gonna try and do some middle-of-the-road thing and be some kind of persona I'm not to um, do that. And I know that's ironic. Uh, it's so expansive. I know that's ironic coming from someone who is now a PNG tuber, right? Like, th that's the thing though, is that Lee is not really anything I'm not. Lee is just a visual representation of my personality and my uh, aesthetic to the stream. You know, going back to representations again. Lee is both a signifier of my creativity in the the, the lore that I created of, and a signifier for my personality being, you know, something that is a product of my personality. And, uh, this is just a cute little line. And I think, you know, I would like that. So, I figure anybody who I will resonate with will like that. And if you don't like that, you're probably not gonna resonate with my, uh, streams. And that... That is fine. You don't have to resonate with my streams. Really, that's the reality of it, is if I wanted to be a big streamer, I would have to make content that tries to resonate with uh, more people and resonates with advertisers to court more sponsorships. And I don't care to do that. I care to make uh, the best stream I can. And I think something like sponsorship reads you know, aren't necessarily a detraction. But sponsorship re- like, I keep- Stream Elements keeps telling me, like, hey, by the way, you can get 200 bucks if you do this, like, Forza thing. And I'm like, I don't care about that game. Like, I keep getting Raid Shadow Legends, and it's like $500, and it's like, I don't- It's $500 max. If I get the most people signed up, that's the most that I can get. And I'm like, that's... First off, that's peanuts for sponsorships. Like, that's not even worth trying. But also... Um... I don't like Raid Shadow Legends. I think it's a, a crapo game. I don't like anything about it. It's clearly just a microtransaction garbage fest. So I would really just be selling out to try and get 500 bucks from Raid Shadow Legends. No, not doing it. It's not happening. You will not see me doing sponsorships for Raid Shadow Legends unless they want to give me a huge bag. I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna sell out because I will certainly sell out for the if the price is right. The problem is that the price isn't right with any of these sponsorships. We've gone from a world where sponsorship meant, you know, four to five figures at least to just being whatever a handful of money they feel like cashing out at the time. And it's like, what's the point? I, I think part of it is just feeling like, oh my god, I'm sponsorable. It's like, you're not, though. You're sponsorable by the worst sponsor. But, like... If you think a Raid Shadow Legend sponsorship is a badge of honor, then that's... Um, no, it's not. I mean, maybe you really like Shadow... I doubt it. I do not believe that they have an actual user base. So much of it has to be bots. 
There's no way. I've never once met someone who's played it. I've never once, like, seen... Like, Genshin Impact, I get it. People like that. I don't understand why. But, like, people do like that, and I'll believe it. But Raid Shadow Legends... No. There's no, like, streams where people are playing it. It's literally just like, hey, here's a video game. You guys like video game. Like, that's what it is. It's very Hello Fellow Kids. It's like, hey guys, we heard there's a lot of money in video games, so play our video game. What's it about? Is it interesting? Uh, it's fantasy. You game. Like, what? What is this? It's just, it's such a pure, obvious cash grab that I don't get why anyone would be dumb enough to fall for it. Like, I almost want to go and do a deep dive into what it's actually like. Come on, dude. I want to do a deep dive into what it's actually like. So that people don't have to have that curiosity of like, huh, Raid Shadow Legends, I wonder if it's any good. It's not. I can already tell you. I can guarantee you with a 100% certainty, Raid Shadow Legends is garbage. It is a bad game made by people who don't care about games and don't care to make a good game, they just care to make a profitable game. I would say the same thing about all this Hoyoverse crap, but, you know, at least they are supporting people that I know and like, so there is more merit to that than the utter cash grab that is Raid Shadow Legends. Like, somebody said it pretty poignantly, although they, they said something more specific that I think is more poignant, but I'm not going to say that necessarily. Uh, but I've never seen fan art of Raid Shadow Legends. I've never found somebody who's a stand for a Raid Shadow Legends character, and that tells me everything I need to know about, about it. If it was any good, somebody would like it. People like many terrible things out there. Heck, I'm one of them. There's many things I love that people think are really awful. But nobody likes Raid Shadow Legends. Nobody wants to do fan art. Not one? It can't be real. Who plays it? Does anybody play it? I don't know. I have to presume... God damn it. I have to presume somebody plays it. They're making money somehow. But I can't fathom who that is. Even the most, like, NFT-boggled idiots who do nothing but grind in games that suck. They... Even they, I can't imagine playing Raid Shadow Legends, man. The only time I've heard someone talk about playing it is in the sponsorship, and I don't trust that. You were paid to say that. I don't believe that anybody who's been paid to say they play it has actually played it. I don't know. I don't know why I'm tearing this down. Everybody knows that Raid Shadow Legends is a nothing. It's just not a game. And I know, there's... A lot of controversy in the phrase, not a game, but like, I hope that we can agree in this case, it is in fact very accurate. Because too often it's used as in, to be elitist, about uh, you know, about what the, the person saying it considers a game, and it's stupid. Many things are games which do not follow any kind of traditional um, traditional conventions of game design. But I think we can agree Raid Shadow Legends may look like a game, may call itself a game, but it's not a game. It's just a time sink. I don't know. If somebody out there has played Raid Shadow Legends, Tell me, is it any good? Is it like actually a sleeper hit? I, I can't wait for those video essays where someone's like, Rich Out Legends is good actually? And it's like, I've been 
I don't know. I've been, uh, I've been in that mindset too of like, uh, well, this thing that people consider bad, it's actually good. The reality is, is all that says about it is that it, it, it speaks more to your creativity for media analysis and how able you are to find something interesting and something that people consider, you know, unengaging or, you know, laughable. Like, it says a lot more about that. And I think, in a way, it's kind of, you know, arrogance, it's ego, to be like, oh, this thing's actually good. Be not just because they, you want to be right, but because you want to show that you can argue it well. And I get it. It is a form of contrarianism, right? Because there's the people, there's contrarianism where you're like, this thing is bad. And there's contrarianism where this thing is good. It's basically just anything any statement that disagrees with the common idea for the sake of disagreement. And I won't say there isn't value in arguing for something you like, but I would also say uh, just think about why you uh, feel the need to argue it. Is it because it you actually do like it? Or is it because you think, you know, you can make a good argument for it? I think you should argue for the things you can't make a good argument for, even. Because that is where the true challenge lies. But, uh, yeah, I'm gonna take a break. I need to use the restroom. So, I will be back in just a bit. Don't go anywhere. Don't touch that internet dial. I'll be right back with more Shovel Knight Plague of Shadows in just a bit. Oops.
Okay, I'm back. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's what he is on the masses. Boom! <laughs> ah, hey, Beard Knight. You got something in your ears? <laughs> You've likely figured out why I'm here. Yes, I need something that you have. Wee! Ha ha ha! How grumpy! Let's settle this with a snowball fight! Yeah, alright. Maybe I should, uh. I should switch the lob piece for this. Yeah, I like how. I do like how customizable the weapon is, but it's like I don't end up actually using most of the customizability. Like, I pretty much just go with a lot of the basic options. Because they just end up being more usable. Ugh, I hate these spikes, man. Like, I get it, they're doing it because NES games used to do it, but like, there's a reason we don't do them anymore, man. It's a bad idea to just have instant death anything in a game. It's, it's just not, it's not great. It's, pr it's a pretty weak design element in any game. For a variety of reasons. It just, it really s removes a lot of player agency and causes a lot of frustration. Okay, um, wait, 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 wait. Uh, actually, I think there's, uh, there's vials in here, so we should get that. Yes. Oh, And let's see what my loadout is. Um. Let's do that. We'll do this. Uh, do this sentry fuse. And this. Here we go. What? Ah. Whoa. Get stuff back. Right, we need the bounce case in this technique. Since he is not a very aerial character. Oh man, the, the one game I really want to get for the stream right now is uh, Mario RPG, the remake. Especially considering I never finished. Um, I never finished the original for the stream, because I just hit, like, a really annoying block right at the end. I was so close, and then I just hit a fight that I could not beat with how I'd been playing the game up to that point. I could probably go back and grind, but I hate grinding, man. I think grinding is itself also a very weak component to any game design-wise. Are those icicles I see on your mask? You all right? What happened? Bowler night happened, and I wouldn't mind a tropical beach getaway right now, Mona. Perhaps when this is all over. But let's focus. We're almost ready. So what are we working on? Hmm. I think that might be cool. Yeah, let's try that out. Oh, and I think I can research. Yep. Probably should have done that before buying stuff. Wow, that's my whole notebook. Thanks so much for helping me with my research. It means a lot to me. What's that scribbled in the margin there? Honestly, I'm not sure. It probably wouldn't work, even if we collected every last cipher coin. Anyway, that's everything. Check out our full arsenal. Boomerangs. 
sparkler powder. Hmm. Ooh, that's nice. Yeah, let's get that. Uh, and then I don't have any money. No, I think I got... Oh, it's like the screw attack. I see. to go. Don't jiggle at me like that, Oolong. Oh yeah, the speedy thing. Alright, what do we got? This is all getting too risky. You can't lose him. I'll reward you however you want. Just do this for me. Why would you help that miserable lunatic seize power and beguile the magicist? What's in it for you? Magicist? Are you kidding me? I'm just trying to talk up your asking price. And there's the other matter. I can't be bought at any price. What uh, What are you two doing here? So, the Magicist, huh? What about her? Is she okay? Let me ask you something, Plague Knight. Where do I fit in your big plans? Are we partners? Are we more? Wait! I... 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 Look at him, b b busted. G you can't even formulate a response. Ha ha ha. What a wimp. This whole time, I thought we were in this together. Was I just a tool to you? I need some time to think about all this. Wow, what was her problem? Unless you think your problems end here, you continue to threaten the Enchantress. Prepare to taste steel. Alright, we're gonna see what we got. Ooh, yeah, that's good. Ooh, that's nice. Oh, that's a deadly combo right there. Oh, that's deadly. Oh, ooh, that's a problem, no. Only works if he actually runs into it, otherwise he just... Ooh, just out of luck. Ah, ah. Oh, jeez. There we go. Oh, I made some, like, just, like, apple cider tea. Or it's basically just, like, apple and different stuff. Hmm. Did I miss something when I was off stream here? What is... Why am I seeing chats on the stream that aren't... Wait a minute. That shows my stream. What is that symbol? Whips and Andre Kiddo, how are you watching this? Am I, like, being streamed somewhere else I don't realize? Because you're not showing up in my regular chat. Oh, is that... Something going on here? Some kind of, hmm. I don't know. Y'all's messages are not showing up in my actual stream chat, so I don't know what is up with that. Ooh, Percy on deck. I love writing that thing. Hey, Mona was in a hurry. Gathered some things and took off. Is she ill? Little no matter. Rain or shine, Percy will fill in as needed. Is she really gone? Well, I just finished up all my other stuff, so. 
we're back out of here. Uh, I need some sort of speed thing for that, so we'll go to Tinker Knight. This is like the most like chip to like created as a chip tune chip tune sort of theme in this game. You can definitely tell that the composer like was a chip tune guy before they hired him for this. No shade. It's awesome. It's just like it definitely has that sound of like someone who was experimenting with um game sound chips before or rather after and like has different ideas of what game soundtracks can be for retro I don't I, I don't know if that makes sense I had the thought in my head I thought it made sense maybe it don't I hope you get it whoop there it is Ugh, I'm always nervous with those double jumps uh, woo. Whoop. <laughs> Not enough space. Well, I'll heal up at least. So it doesn't go totally to waste. Okay, I can see. There's some goodies up here that I want. Okay, I thought those gears would still be coming. I guess not. Hmm. Woo! Not having the float makes it feel so much more nerve-wracking to do the uh, bomb jumps. But it's like they do the same thing. It's just faster. So I just gotta trust my jumps. Okay, I guess there's only two that show up. I remember that area in the uh, Shovel Knight one just still going. Through. Let me out. Okay. Oh, jeez. Can't see the floor. We gotta just ding ding put the away. I should probably move that. It's just. It's a good spot for visuals, but not necessarily a good spot for uh, gaming. But I only really game on stream. Since that's all I have time for now. Ugh, the life of an adult. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I miss being able to game regularly. Sometimes I do. Every now and then, like for a week or something, I'll just every night play an hour to game. Usually at least a couple hours. It's like if I have extra time, I want to like socialize. I want to talk to my like roommates and hang out and watch stuff or something. Crap, 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 crap! Ah. Oh. You know, that was something I was talking with my mom. Uh, we're talking about a trip we're doing. And it's like gonna be probably the first time I've seen parts of my family in, since like high school. They just live so far away I haven't had the opportunity. Uh, and she was talking about how, you know, they like to socialize a lot when someone is in town. They like to visit, they like to spend time together, you know, go out to restaurants, whatever. Um, and my mom was like, that's not what I really want to do all the time. And it's like, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can agree. <laughs> I love to socialize. And I mean, you know, somebody's free food. Somebody's taking me out to a restaurant, they're like, I'm, I'm game. Granted, there's not a ton of things I can do at this point, but I, uh, yeah, I'll find something. That's the thing, it's like, I don't eat meat unless there's no other option. Like, if someone is treating me to a restaurant, it's like, oh, you know, if they want to take me to a steakhouse, I'll be like, okay, I'm not gonna throw that offer in the dirt if, if there's no other option but then it's like dairy I can't do dairy I'm finally at the point where it's like and it's not even just a lactose intolerance thing at this point it's a uh, my face breaks out like crazy like even if I just have a little bit of dairy I have just like my acne 
goes just bonkers for a few days, and I've just finally gotten to a point where I have clear skin. I thought it was sugar too, but actually I've been eating like a fair amount of sugar lately, and my face is not breaking out, so it really is just the dairy. Granted, when I say a fair amount of sugar, I mean like... Like a bowl of cereal in the morning. I don't do a ton of sugar. To begin with, you know, I don't really do soda. Um, mainly, I just can't handle it anymore. My tolerance for sweetness. Like, part of it was I quit soda, and then um, soda got so much sweeter. Yes, man. Okay. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, papa. Okay. Uh, okay. Ah, son of a... I mean, this is like... I don't think this is a required area, is it? I think that there's other options. Uh, no, this is required. I think the area I've been specifically trying to do isn't required. So I might just not do that. Because this is an any percent one. You know? it's, it's, I'm not trying to 100%. I probably could without too much extra. Di it'd probably be like an extra stream to get all the like things that I miss. But like, I don't care that much. Though I am kind of curious now that they say that the coins is something if you get all the coins. I do like that. Uh, ba -ba 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 -burp. Yeah, I think part of the problem with me doing these streams so late in the day is that I don't have the energy to stream. I don't know, there's like, that's the thing, is if I wanted to do this full time, I would like stream every day without a problem. Like, my schedule would allow it, and I enjoy streaming, so I, it's not like I wouldn't want to do it. It's just, uh... Uh, it's a lot of... it takes some energy. And again, with everything I've seen, it's like... It's supplemental. Right? Streaming and podcasting are kind of in the same place. Where they're good as side content from your actual content that you do. They are not good as their own... Uh, as their own content. Like, there are very few people who can just make a living, who can just make, uh, or even, not even make a living, but who can find a following just, just streaming or just doing that. In reality, if you do that, you have to do tons of marketing efforts. And that's the point where I was like, I'm fine with just being a small streamer. Because, like, I enjoy it. But I don't want to have to market. I tried for a little bit, and it's like, I was getting no traction, and it was obnoxious. Like, both on my part, like, I felt obnoxious doing it, and also, it was just obnoxious to deal with. Even just doing regular YouTube shorts, I was like, man, I don't want to do this. This feels... nobody cares. I was getting a lot of downvotes. So, I don't know. Uh, hello, Ivo. How you doing? Playing Shovel Knight. I'm bemoaning the fact that you have to market stuff to be popular. Uh, yeah. Maybe what you got? No, oh, I don't have the relic. Ah! I do need that though. That's okay. I'll come back for it. I can go back to the armored outpost at some point. But yeah. I just. I don't know. I never really want. I don't want to be a big streamer. The appeal of being a full-time streamer is pretty 
potent for sure. But like to do it as an actual kid, uh, you have great streams. Hey, thanks for the cheer. I'm glad that my uh my alerts are still working. I haven't checked them since I started streaming again. That was the designer of uh, the most popular board game of 2018 saying that I have good streams. So, I felt very happy about that. Granted, I was streaming his games at the time. I can't now because his games are difficult to stream on here. Oh, cool. Yeah, thanks for dropping in. You know, lurk if you wanna, but... It's all good. Go, go doing your moderating stuff. You're doing God's work being a moderator. It's difficult and it's un... It's thankless. It's important work. Uh, magic. Prop, prop, prop. Ah, ah. Go down, go down. Thank you. Uh, wait, there's probably some kind of extra over there. Whoops. Ah, uh, the guys came back. Yeah, all of my favorite streamers are not huge streamers. Because the huge streamers are the ones where it's like... Like Hassan. Hassan... Probably makes incredible money streaming. But also, it's like he can't interact with chat. It's not even a matter of like he won't. It's like he literally cannot. He's got so many people chatting. It goes by so fast. I believe it's in slow mode and like follower only and everything. And it's still like... Like every second is like 30 new messages. So all he can do is really um, react to chat trends. When like a lot of people are saying the same thing, he can be like, hey, that's not... You know, he can, he can say something about that. But like... Yeah, that sounds miserable, man. I want to be able to have a community, you know, talk to people. I'm not really at the point where I have many regulars. I have a couple regulars, one of which is like an actual... In fact, in both cases, are people that I just know from off-stream, so... Eh, I'll take what I can get. I appreciate anybody watching that does. But like, if I wasn't enjoying streaming, and in fact, the, in the past this has been the, the case, when I'm not enjoying streaming, I don't do it. Like, if I don't feel like streaming, I don't. And when I'm have in, like, a bad place and I don't feel like I can deal with streaming, I don't. I don't force myself to do it just because there's this allure of, oh, maybe I could do it as a job, and it's like, I don't want to do it as a job. It would be fun to get some, you know, a return on investment for all of the work that I've put into it, certainly, but, you know, if I have to do it as a job, then it's just not even going to be worth it to me. One second. Some kind of thing happened there. There we go. Ah, I had to adjust the thing in OBS. I use OBS.live. I don't know how y'all feel about, about that. I... I don't want to break that. No, no, no. I, I like it a lot because it's... It basically is still just OBS with more features. Right? I wasn't... Even when... The brief time that I was using uh, Streamlabs... Uh, I didn't like it. It, it, it just felt over bloated and it wasn't, you know, most of the stuff it was doing was not serving the kind of, th it's like if you want to just use a template and just it start going, it's probably great, but if you want to make your own custom stuff, it's like, it's just getting in the way of all of that, and it's just like way more taxing on your hardware for no great benefit. Um... Yeah, so now I don't... I, I barely use that, and now I just use this because it basically gives you most of the functionality of uh, Streamlabs, but it, you know, doesn't suck. I shouldn't say that. I'm trying to be more positive in my life. I watched that Mr. Rogers movie, the, the Tom Hanks Mr. Rogers movie, 
and it, like it really made me want to try and be a better person. Like, because really all the the core message was just like being a better person is not something that some people are just good at. It is work. It's it's difficult to be like you know a nice caring person. It's taxing, and it sometimes it is too hard. Sometimes it's something that you can't deal with. So you know. The only thing stopping you from being a caring person is just having the energy and putting in the effort to do so. So, I'm trying my best to do so. I'm trying to be, you know, nice and positive. I'm trying to see things from other people's perspective. The wild thing to me is since I've been positive, started to try and be more positive and caring, um, I don't know. It, th there was a situation recently where I chose to be sympathetic to someone who sounded like they were in a bad situation. And yes, this person was not a nice person. But like, to me, it's like the greatest challenge of being a caring person is, uh, is to be sensitive and caring for someone who doesn't deserve it, who is actually a, like, really mean, you know, uh, or if not mean, like, you know, doing bad things. In this case, it was someone who is expected to be scamming people? I don't, that was my thing, is like, they, the thing they were saying is like, they d did this project, and then they just kind of disappeared, and they're not giving refunds for merch that they didn't send out. And that's not okay. But having worked on so many projects, um, having worked on so many projects, my first thought is that this person probably got really overwhelmed. Very often, people assume People assume that once something they're working on something good, once something starts being successful, that it's going to be easy. When in reality, the more successful you get, the more work it is. Like, you're just busy all the time, just keeping up with, you know, keeping up with your connections. Uh, just doing basic responsibilities. Even, like, fun promo stuff you might do is work. And it's exhausting, and it can be overwhelming. So, uh, in so many projects I've been on, successful and not, people have uh, people have gone overwhelmed, and they've just kind of disappeared because they just don't know how to explain to everybody that they're overwhelmed and they can't deal. They can't even. They're so overwhelmed they can't even deal with just communicating that. That that sucks. I don't want that for anybody. I think that you know. If you are in a position where you're being overwhelmed, that you should, like, be able to take a break. Even if that means shirking, like, important, you know, responsibilities for a while. Like, processing refunds for something. At the same time, though, it's like, if you support a project... This has always been a big problem with crowdfunding in general, is that people are just like... They assume it's like a store. And now Kickstarter has the thing when you pledge where it's like, Kickstarter is not a store. You are just supporting this project. Any reward is a bonus that is not guaranteed. And it's like, yeah, that's always what Kickstarter was supposed to be about, but because people are usually only doing it for the reward, a lot of them have forgotten that it's like, no, there's no guarantee you get anything or that the project gets finished. You're just supporting the process. And processes can go a lot of different ways. You know? So, um... So yeah, I... Th my first thought was like, man, I hope the person is, like, doing okay and is, like, you know not freaking out because like that's so much pressure 
now because there's money involved in all of this. And it's like, if you get overwhelmed, can't deal with any of your responsibilities, and there's money involved, it's like, it's not okay. But it's also like, yeah, that only adds to it. And if people are some are now demonizing you, acting like you're a bad actress scam artist for, you know, just not having enough spoons, that's, that sucks. And wh what can you do? Because it's just going to become more overwhelming. It's a vicious cycle. And that's the thing is everybody's quick to jump to like, it's a scam. And it's like, they were saying that it might happen again. And at that point, it's like, yes, you should definitely warn people that that is probably a scam. If this person is, you know, ha you, sh you can't have that reason any longer that it's like, I'm overwhelmed if you're deciding to take on more work. If you have work that you have not finished and you take on more work, then anybody affected by you not taking on that work should be, is, is gonna be reasonably upset. And will probably tell people that you have done this. That's just how social currency works. Um, but yeah, I was just like, I feel worried for this person there, overwhelmed. Uh, and someone like took massive offense to that because they, they, I'm guessing, this is maybe projected, but in their mind, it's like this person is bad and they are only, they are a scam artist. And it's like, I'm just sympathizing with someone and they're like, do you think we're not? And it's like, I didn't say that. I said, I am. And say anybody needed to, that just literally, that's what my emotions were, were, you know, feelings of sympathy towards this, you know, other human being. This group of people is not involved in it. Like, yes, it sucks if you got scammed, but, like, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about... Ha I didn't see the post there. I thought it was just a platform. Um... But, yeah, it's like... I was just like... I had to break it down. I think that's the thing that frustrates me lately in so many arguments is I have, to, I have to continue to break down pretty basic communication. Like, I say a thing and people take offense to it because they read so much into it that isn't there. And it's not even a tone thing, it's just poor reading comprehension. Like, there was a whole thing I had where this guy kept trying to argue, kept trying to say I was wrong when I said that Tabletop Simulator is not objectively the best. And after a while, I realized the problem is he thought what I was saying was that it's objectively not the best, which is not the same thing. Objectively not the best would mean that something else is the best. Not objectively the best means that it is only subjectively the best, which is what I was trying to say to him. And he didn't get that because he didn't understand the original thing because he read it wrong. And like... I get it, man. There's literacy problems all over this country, all over this world. But, like, don't begin an argument if you do not understand the base premise. Because all you are going to do is frustrate everyone having to explain the basics of what was actually being said. The entire argument was about something completely different, frankly. But at a certain point, I just had to explain to him why his argument was nonsense. Because he continued to try and say why something was objectively the best. And it's not possible, because that's not how objectivity works. It is a subjective opinion. No matter how much he believes in it, it's subjective. That's just... That's just how the world works, man. But I did appreciate that someone really big in that server, who's done a lot of work, was on my side with that, and was ex also explaining why his statements were subjective, and that his arguments that they were objective were just on their face incorrect. Hmm. Yeah, that one's, that one's been sticking with me. That crowdfunding one stuck with me. I just... I don't know, man. I was talking with someone 
recently because I'm I'm doing research into uh, that thing that I have not announced yet that is going to be a part of this stream at some point. And uh, there we go. Oh my god. Uh, and yeah, I think more than anything, I was like asking about hypotheticals, and they were just like, you know, you don't need to worry about hypotheticals. Trust the people you're going to be working with. And I'm just like, I want to. I really want to trust people. But it's difficult for me. Especially because, at least lately, so many things where I state something with complete confidence because it's something that I am very uh, knowledgeable about. I'm just going to forget about this money. It's not that much. Like, sometimes I ramble. Sometimes I rant. Sometimes I don't say things clearly. But if I make a statement, a very confident statement about something, I only do so if it's either A, something I am 100% certain I know about, or B, like, I, I only make really confident statements when I am absolutely sure that I am correct on it, based on all of the knowledge that I have gained from a lot of reading and a lot of studying generally, and I don't do it for many topics. But I do do it for the ones that I am personally very invested in, like game design, like um, recording and other audio uh, considerations. So it's just gen- and that's the thing. If I am wrong, I will say so. It's like, if you can prove me wrong, then it's like, all right, you're right, I was incorrect. Thank you, because generally I want to learn more. So if you have new information that contradicts my understanding of it, then that's awesome. Because it's something new for me to understand about it. But if you are not going to be able to prove me wrong, it just kind of shakes my confidence. Right? And it has been shaking my confidence. Because people have been arguing things that I know I'm correct on, and they've been doing it in a way that does not disprove my point. It just shows that they do not understand the point to begin with. Or it's been some other argument about something else. And it's like, I know I seem very outspoken, right? And I am very extroverted, which is a rarity nowadays, apparently. It's certainly a rarity in the uh, circles I am in. But, uh... It did take me a long time to build up my confidence to speak out about anything. I've been, like, so often, I would be knocked down by people who don't care if I'm right. They just want to feel big about themselves. Or, you know, people who uh, are no more than me but are, you know, cool about it. And I won't deny I've done that on occasion when I'm not, um, I don't have the energy to be as level-headed as I want to be, or if I get overwhelmed, as I was discussing earlier, right? Like, it will be difficult for me to word things in the way that I'd like to. So, yeah. I find it frustrating when I feel confident to speak up about something because I do, in fact, know about it. And then some, you know, some tertiary consideration comes in that really has very little to do with it and does not, in fact, do anything to prove me wrong, but just, uh, just ends up making me look like a jerk for speaking up at all. I find it very frustrating. And, yeah, after that happening very, very often lately, in, in several different communities, my confidence has been pretty shaken. I don't really feel confident to talk about anything, even in areas where I probably should, you know? Or in areas where they literally asked me to, and I, you know, 
that well they asked the group and then you know I'm one of the only people in the group that is all that outspoken about stuff and might speak up so you know when all they've done is tell me basically tell me that I can't and that all I'll have to do is apologize and backtrack every statement I make you know not because I'm necessarily wrong, but because the way that I expressed it was incorrect. I just, I don't want to, you know, I just don't want to speak up anymore. And that sucks. I'd like to be able to speak up and be a part of a, the group, but it's like, if I'm clearly not welcome to do that, then I won't. Yeah, it's mainly that it's just happening all over the place for me lately. It's really, like, if it was happening in one place, I wouldn't be doing so much self-reflection on it, but, like, it's been happening all the time lately. And it's about stuff that it's, like... I don't know. I, j I just don't know what I'm supposed to do about it. I basically can't say anything about anything I know because it's... You know, it's inappropriate to 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 uh, I don't know. It. I don't want to say it's inappropriate to know stuff. I'm sure there's a better way to put that that isn't you know as condescending. I guess, more than anything, it's very difficult to have conversations with people that I would like to see as my peers, usually in game design, um, who have like such a vastly different concept of it that we it's almost like we're speaking different languages, right? Because like, I'm going to speak using the terms and the knowledge that I've gained from reading a great deal of books from some of the masters or, you know, people who are speaking on psychology, sociology. I need to uh, look more at, um, you know, behavioral therapy because uh, that's Gabe Newell was talking about that in the uh, Half-Life documentary. It's like a big, useful, a very useful thing to know as a game designer because game design is a uh, it is a you know it utilizes a lot of psychology so having an understanding of human psychology is kind of important to being able to use it effectively and yeah in terms of praxis right like, people seem to think that, like, just sitting down and working out the game is all the practice you need for game design. But no, not really. It's it's important, obviously. You need to be able to, like, actually take the time to, like, make the thing. Right? And that is part of practice. But uh, in terms of game design, a major part of practice is playtesting. Is observing and interacting with your players to actually understand ah, ah. 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 now I can't get the pink okay is a uh, yeah it's practicing play it's like actually and I don't mean like like just you know playing a game with someone I mean like literally practicing experiencing play with others both in other games and in your game like seeing how play functions in your game oh look it's plague knight i heard you might show up why have you come here ah the esteemed inventor i do so respect your craft <laughs> relinquish your essence and you won't be harmed what I don't think so, bird mask. You have your own brain. Use it or lose it. So, yeah. 
and like that's where I'm coming from, a very academic kind of background. Though, so, you know, academic does not necessarily only mean going to school, but also like uh, I would say a focus on study could be considered academic. That's how it is for me. I read just like actual textbooks. I'm not. I don't like skim them. I, I read them cover to cover. Um. So, uh, yeah. And so when I talk to people who are very praxis focused, who learn things pretty much only through doing, uh, it's difficult. It's really difficult to communicate because, yeah, it feels like we have... It, it doesn't even feel like we have necessarily different perspectives. It's that I can't communicate the fact that I agree or disagree with their perspective. Like, often I will agree with what they're saying, but then I will say, like, this is how that is expressed academically, and then they take offense to that. They, they're they like, what? no, that's not what I call it. And it's like, yeah, but that's what, you know, the people who study this all the time call it. Or if I bring up stuff that's, like, well-documented and many or problems that people have figured out in game design already to a high degree, you know, stuff that they're, like, so... So many times in playtests I've been doing lately, I'll just mention, like, some basic concepts that totally solve a problem that they're having. And they're surprised, and I'm like, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, the, the, that's the thing. Praxis is trying to solve problems, right? And trying to build your intuition for solving problems. But the reality is, if you go and look at all the study materials that are out there, someone else has probably solved most of the problems you run into. And your solution might be different, but the reality is, is that the majority of the solutions you find are going to be the same stuff they already found, so it's just going to save you time to look it up and, you know, find out that way, rather than just fumble around until you figure it out through your own trial and error. Like, just just trust that people know, you know, that people have figured this stuff out and, like, give it a shot. And if you don't like it, you can always try and find another solution still, but, like, at least, like, check out what they're saying to see if, like, maybe it does work for you. Plus, like, perspective-wise, like, reading someone else's perspective on game design is, you know, Pretty important. Hearing other people's perspective on how it works is important. And is like, uh. Yeah, you're just doing yourself a disservice if you don't, like, look into it. Ah, now, Tinker Knight. There's an engineer who knows ballistics. Too bad he doesn't know when he's outmatched. <laughs> yeah, I asked nicely, but he's too stubborn. What should we work on? Get both, give them a shot. Come on, man. There we go. Okay, and then we're gonna... And then we'll get... Cool. Um, yeah, it's eight thirty. Uh, I'll be, yeah, I'll do the flying machine and uh, beat this guy, and then I think I'll call it a night. Ah, 
the alchemist. Tales of your exploits have reached far and wide. Heh! <laughs> really? And who are you? An interested party. I seek only to find the bravest fighters and test them. What? By rubbing your shoes on the carpet and poking them? We've got places to be! Haha! <laughs> Zip! And who's the worst? Whoop! Whoop! Um. Oh, for the reasons. That's. Ah, ah, where do I go? Okay, and go by it? Nope, almost. There we go. I don't know, I'm not even like... There are plenty of specific examples I'm thinking of, but in just in general, man, communication online is very frustrating. I can try and say something. I, I say things just naturally with my personality off the cuff, and then it keeps blowing up in every different place I'm in for some reason. And then I have to spend so long very carefully wording my statements to make it clear that no offense was meant at any point. And, yeah. I don't know. I don't know, man. I, I, I... It's just exhausting to have to think of, like, every single possible way that something could, you know, spark an argument. Because the reality is, I could spark an argument off of literally any statement if I really wanted to. It's just a, f a matter of creativity, so I can't really... I can't really account for every single perspective where somebody is going to have a problem with something I say. And it's like, if I say anything confidently at all, someone's going to have a problem. Because it doesn't align perfectly with their perspective, and that's... I mean, that's just a reality of people, but, like, I don't know, man. I'm I'm tired. That's really what it is. I'm just very tired. As much as I love people and I love socializing, it's, it's very exhausting when it's like this. And it's just a per perfect storm of it happening this way. Uh, a lot. So, anyways. Uh, you see, book knowledge will never replace swordsmanship. Despite your sizable arsenal, I was still able to land many strikes. And your reliance on tonics has no place in a proper duel. But one should never underestimate even the lowliest enemy. I shall leave you with that thought. Haha! <laughs> wonder if people can tell when I roll my eyes under this mask. Let me get that cash. Let me get that cash money. Propeller Knight. This one I also am not a huge fan of. I don't hate though. Oh, come on, man. <sighs> come on, let me see if I can do it. Great! I'm glad that this thing that would be so easy to deal with as Shovel Knight is, like, incredibly difficult as Plague Knight! Like, I get it. It's, it's fun that, you know... Oh, yeah, I have the... Forgot I have the screw attack thing. I don't even need to deal with that. I... Like, I get it. I get that that's, like, half the appeal, is that, you know, oh, wow, look at how things have, like, 
Look at how things have changed between these two characters in the same setting, but... Uh... Yeah, it's just kind of frustrating. If an area was clearly designed for one specific type of play, and you put a different type of play in it, it's gonna be different, and it's kind of interesting, but it's mostly just not gonna work great. And it's just gonna be, like, needlessly difficult. So while I think it's fun, I'm definitely glad that they, you know, if this had been what all four had been like, just like, completely unchanged, yeah, I would have maybe been like, I don't know about having these. They would seem like really unnecessary. Like, clearly they put a lot of thought into it. I'm not gonna say it's lazy or anything, but it is, it's certainly not as a uh, high effort as the other two campaigns that came out. Or really even the base campaign, because in that one they did have to do, you know, their particular level designs. But yeah, it's just very clear, like, this was them kind of checking off a Kickstarter box. And it's not, it's not super fun. That's so many checkpoints, man! Oh god, and I've got to do this bit again. Okay, well, I did it better this time. Just let me break the... Break the blocks! Stuff like that, man. That's like such a basic move in the other campaign. Here, it's just like a massive annoyance. They didn't design it for this play. They designed it for Shovel Knight. So just jamming this guy in there does not make for a good game. It makes for an interesting game, but it feels like a mod. And the kind of mods, the kind of mod that I don't like, where they just slap a different thing into a game that it was not meant for. Whatever, I just want to be done with it. I, I, I'm glad that, you know, I had, I'd only played this once. Um, since it came out, and I was like, maybe, maybe it wasn't as bad as I thought, you know? Maybe it was one that I'll enjoy a lot more, and it's like, you know what? I can appreciate a lot more about it this time around. But no, I think that I am still, I was still correct in saying that this is the weakest one. At least for my play style. It's just... very frustrating. Okay. Otherwise. I just 
certain point, man. I just I can't. I can't. I know, people are going to be like, get better at the game. And it's like, I'm fine at the game. The point is that this design... This design for this character was retrofitted to a level design that it wasn't meant for. And while in some places that makes interesting scenarios, most of the time it just makes for a experience that is appropriately inconsistent. It doesn't incohesive. It doesn't coalesce in a way that's like interesting. I don't know, man. I think with streaming more than anything, it's like, I love video games. I don't think I necessarily like playing video games for an audience. Because video games, for me, it's not... I mean, games in general. Like, the point of games to me are to experience a different reality. And so while there are times where I can get in the flow state that I was talking about earlier, I can go down. Here we go. God damn it. There are times where I can get into the flow state while streaming. Like, Highline Miami was probably the first time, honestly, where I was, like, genuinely just in the game. Uh, commentary, performance, and games are just two separate, separate realities, you know what I'm saying? So having to do them at the same time just ends up being, like, a lot. Right? I'm having to come up with different narration uh, choices at the same time that I'm just having to do stuff. It's like uh, it's like the it's just so much multitasking. It's very difficult. I think people think it's just playing games, right? Playing games and talking. It's like technically yes, but try doing that. Try sitting down and playing and playing a game you like and say something interesting about the game constantly. Don't let there be a gap. If, there's a, if you are silent for more than five seconds, you have failed at this challenge. So if you can find something interesting to say, to fill in the space, while still playing the game to a decent level of skill, then you should be a streamer. It sounds like you're really good at it. Right? But, uh, I don't think I necessarily am. I think I'm a decent performer. Because, you know, I do it a lot. And a, uh below average gamer. I'm not very good at games. I enjoy experiencing them and analyzing them and thinking about them, but I'm not really that good. And that's, you know, as I've said, being good at something is not a barrier to entry to games. That was something in my sequelitis response video that I made. Uh, one of the guys I responded to, because in that, if you haven't watched it, I would really love it if you go and watch the Zelda sequelitis response number four million. So the number four space million, like the, the the word million. Um, because it was a response not just to sequelitis. Because frankly, I do agree with most of what Karen said. I think some of the stuff he said was uh less less concrete than he realized, especially like when it comes to puzzle design. I don't think... I think his views on puzzle design are a little narrow. Because, like, yeah, the... Uh, I mean, this is all in the video, but... that I made. But, um... His point is that the aha moment is what makes a puzzle, and it's like, uh... Not necessarily. 
that is the the moment of relief. But art is a technique of tension and relief, right? So the ways that you create tension, like uh, hidden hidden information, God, go down the thing. Thank you. Oh my fucking god. The ways that you create tension and release can differ. So while the with the puzzle, the aha moment is going to be the release, how you create that t tension, and even what you choose, because like it could not be that aha moment. Um, that that tension that you create can come in a lot of different ways. And again, this is why I say I maybe want to redo this. I feel like my points on it are a little better. But one of the guys made like this two hour, I think what he thinks is a video essay. Basically, all he did was show moments where Aaron was not good at Ocarina of Time and thinks that that's just self-evident that he should not have an opinion on it. And it's like, that's a garbage viewpoint. That's not how it works. And then if it comes down to that, it's like, okay, so what if somebody's better at you than the game? Or better than you at the game? D it does their opinion hold more water? What if they have a terrible opinion? Like, you're only saying this about Aaron because you disagree with him, but what if somebody said the same thing and was better at the game than you? Which could totally happen. There's many people who are great at Ocarina who also recognize what Aaron said. So, it's just, it's a non-argument. Oh, okay. So that just finally gives me a melee weapon. That's helpful. So yeah, I found that frustrating because it's... Because it's not a real argument and it's entirely based on elitism. It acts like uh, criticism is a meritocracy where only the people who know it. And then it's like, okay, so you're good at playing the game. Well, what about somebody who's good at making games? What if somebody made a game better than Ocarina of Time and also agreed with Aaron? What would be your point then? Because you can't point it, like, you can point it, say, like, Aaron hasn't made a game. And I could go either way on that. Um, I would say, you know, as per the credits, one of his collaborators is Barry Kramer, who has a degree in game design. I'm not going to continue down that way because I just want to get here. Uh, so I think that that, you know... God, just do the thing. Um... So, like, yeah, even if Aaron's points that he interjects aren't 100% correct, they are coming from a place of being, you know, very well studied. Enough to graduate from a school. So, like, I don't know, man. I just don't get the point there. Because, like, all it's basically saying is you're not qualified to talk... Like, that's the thing. He wasn't refuting any of Aaron's points. He was just trying to refute Aaron's, um, Aaron's right to make points. And that's, that's not how that works. Everybody has a right to an opinion. That doesn't mean that everyone's opinion is correct and valid, but you're allowed to have it, right? And not all opinions are created equal. That was something I also brought up, is like, The opinions in Sequelitis are, are, like, written over years and years and, um, and discussed with people who know what they're talking about. Like, he doesn't write them on his own. He talks with Barry, who knows a lot about game design because he went to school for it. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, and it's like, yeah, it's well-researched, it's well-reasoned, it's sourced. Like, yeah, there's opinion to it, obviously. It's an opinion piece. 
But, like, that's the thing, is that, to me, his opinion has more value. Because he took the time to support it. Anybody's allowed to have an opinion, but if you don't take the time to support your opinion, then it doesn't have the same value as someone who did take that time. I, yeah, that's just what frustrates me more than anything. There's one! I didn't go into it. Because, like, I had a lot more notes. I really, I cut the video way down. I could have made it so much longer. Like, I, I had a lot more videos that I wanted to reply to in it, and uh, what I wanted to say about stuff. The, 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 one, the one that I really, really got me, the one that I really freak out about in that video, where he was just like, uh, 2D and 3D are just too different, you can't compare them. And it's like... Like, what an awful summary. Like, really show to me that you don't understand what you were just talking about, dude. Like, I don't know what to tell you. You just, you, if you sincerely watch the entirety of Aaron Hansen's sequelitis on Ocarina of Time, and your conclusion is you can't, you can't compare them because one is 3D and one is 2D. But truly, your opinion has no value. Like, m like, once again, you're still allowed to have it. But understand that every single opinion about it is better than yours. That is the worst possible opinion you could have because it completely ignores the entire point that was being made in the video and the entire point of game design. Game design can be applied whether it's two-dimensional on an NES or whether it's three-dimensional on a PS5 or PS6, PS7, or in a board game. Things about game design are still applicable, and a lot of the things that are being said are things that will apply to all game design. Zelda is a case study in the larger picture of how game design works. But yeah, one th like that guy's video was infuriating because clearly he... It was part of some series he does where he basically just reacts to a video somebody re recommends. Which, wow, awesome content, dude. Genius. I'm just gonna t ramble about something I just watched five minutes ago. Like... I spent months wa I mean, I still watch Zelda Sequel Ice all the time, but I spent, like, months watching all of these videos, doing my research on, like, the origins of the different design concepts for Zelda, and this dipshit just comes in, watches it once, and then just rambles into a microphone about, like, oh, you know, he didn't talk about the water t Oh my god, the amount of times... The amount of videos, specifically his, because he said it like five times. It was like, like the water temple, I can't believe you didn't mention it. And it's like, so many of these videos did that, but he just was the worst about it. Whoever this guy was, I don't remember. It's in the playlist. I've made a playlist that is linked in the description of that video of everybody I react uh, responded to. Um, but like... Yeah, the point I wanted to make about that that I didn't have time for... Maybe I should do it. Maybe I should remake it and just call it an extended version. And just be like, this is my new thoughts, you know, now that I know way more about game design. Because at the time, it's like, I had a, a decent idea about game design, but I wasn't as well read as I am now. I think I would have a lot more to say about it now. Um, so I would probably respond to my own response. Uh, and frankly, yeah, I want to do video essays in general, so maybe that's a good spart spot to start, is to just revisit the two that I made previously, which were that, and talking about Fantasy Flight's Fallout, which I'm not super happy about either. I, yeah. I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. I gotta use the bathroom, so I'll, I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. BRB.
Yeah, I'm back. Um, yeah, I think the responses to that sequelitis are overwhelmingly just a microcosm of uh, what online discussion about game design is. And just, yeah, so many of the responses were people... People having strong opinions, but not having clear... Oh, ooh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Not having a clear way to express them, and not having a clear idea of what was fueling those opinions, right? Um, because... In so many cases, like, they're, they're, the point they were trying to make is like, I think Aaron should have been nicer about it. And it's like, well, I suppose. And I would have preferred he not, you know, he uses uh, a slur that is no longer customary. That is pretty unfortunate and it definitely makes me feel like every time I rewatch it. Um, Uh, because it is an old video at this point. Uh, and when I made my video, wait, it was like 2018, I think. So it it was really not um, it was really not that old yet. Now it's like nearly a decade out. So I feel like there's a lot more to be said. Um, uh, an interesting thing that I was bringing up here is how. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being very inspired by H Bomber Guy's media criticism. Because I think that. Yeah, I, I like his work a lot, and I think. I don't want to, like, crib from it. In fact, if. More than anything, the style that I'm thinking of is more uh, CJ the X, who's not a huge YouTuber yet. Uh, don't know the pronouns, so I'll just say CJ the X. CJ. CJ the X does some interesting. It's not all media criticism. Ah, very close. But it is all very stylistically interesting. So I'm probably going to crib from that a bit. Uh, a lot of it is personality wise, so I just think that our personalities are similar enough that that style would work for me. But that's just where I'm going to start. W one of the big things, I think, with my older videos is... I had a lack of confidence that, at the time, I didn't realize I was hiding. Right? Because I was still pretty new at being a professional performer. And I thought I was doing pretty good, and I thought I'd, like, had a pretty good sense of self. But when I rewatched those videos, I'm like, wow, I... I'm pretty nervous. Like, when I do the the Fallout one, I, I was, like, so worried about, like, showing enthusiasm that the whole thing is in this, like, weird, like, radio deadpan voice. And it's, it's, it's strange. It's very different from how I act. Like, even at the time, different how I acted in life. I guess I just thought, like, if I stick to this particular thing, treat it like a character voice, then I know things will be consistent, at least. Hold on, I'm gonna change. Um, so I went with that, and I think it makes for something that is content-wise pretty correct, but stylistically very dull. So I'm not shocked that one didn't pop off. In terms of the Zelda one, uh, I don't know. Probably just bad timing. Because, like, I did it years after everybody else had stopped talking about it. So while I have a, some views on that, it's not... I don't know. I feel like a lot of people would be interested in that. 
and a lot of people haven't watched it, and that's fine. I will, yeah, I think to start off my video essaying, I will probably do, um, I'll probably just do those two video essays again, because I, I believe I still have the script for both. And if not, you know, I can just rewrite it and just just watch it, see what points I want to stick to. Uh, and yeah, just, you know, expand on my points. Revise any points that I don't really agree with anymore. Like, I go on a whole thing about where Z-targeting came from. And it's... I don't really remember why I did that. I, I just thought it was a cool anecdote. And someone in the comments was like, yeah, it's a cool anecdote, but I don't see, w I don't get what you mean. I'm like, yeah, that's fair. I don't really know what I was saying. Because the, the anecdote, um, the anecdote is basically that the, uh, the team that was working on Zelda on a company outing went to, what is it? It's like the, the theater park that they base that one part of Paper Mario on. Paper Mario well, Origami King, where it's like kind of like historical theater stuff. And it's like, it's kind of like a Renaissance fair, but you know, Japanese and it's owned by a company and there's like other stuff there too. It's not all that. But in this case, it was like a historical, not like a uh, sword fight, but it was like a samurai and a ninja, I think. Um, and there's a, uh, there's a weapon, because they already wanted to base it on Chambara films, which are like the, you know, classic sword fighty films where they, they tee off, and then it's like a big flash, and then one of them falls to the ground, like that classic samurai film thing. Um, and so while they were there watching the show, it's like a ninja and a samurai, and one part of the scene has the ninja, like, get th this, like, chain weapon, it's like a chain with a blade on the end, looped around the ankle of the, the samurai, and so now the samurai has to follow around him in a circle, right? Um, so that's where they got the idea for Z-targeting from. It's like, oh, okay, so if you are, like, you know, moving in a circle around the guy. But I actually, I, okay, my point was... When they did that, it's like they were thinking, you know, they were thinking, like, that's a cool dynamic thing, right? Like, you're moving in a circle, it forces you into an interesting idea, and as I figured out earlier on the stream, it turns it back into two-dimensional, right? Uh, but the point I had is that in that scene, the, the, um... In that scene, the one who is in control is the ninja, which if we're looking at the metaphor of the fights in Ocarina, the ninja is the enemy. You are circling around the enemy like you are stuck to him and going in a circle. So inadvertently by using this cool thing, they accidentally created a dynamic between the player and uh, the enemies. Very close. This level's so hard. Um, a, uh, yeah, they create a dynamic between the player and the enemies within the combat that that meant that the, uh, the, the enemy was in control. That's the point I was trying to make. Okay, I, that's the thing is, even in the video, I didn't really make that clear. Um, yeah, I think the, one of the bigger points I made, and this was one that I saw in at least one response, maybe a couple, is, uh, I disagree that the original Legend of Zelda was great. I think it's, that's a lot of nostalgia speaking for, on Aaron's part. Where, yes, it's really, it's really fascinating on a game design level. 
but you have to look at it from the point of when all of the original NES games, Mario, Zelda, they were in a similar position to what they were when they made Ocarina. So instead of making a big leap from 2D to 3D and what that meant for gaming and game design, they were making a big leap into games at all. Like, they literally could do anything they wanted in terms of creativity. Son of a... Biscuit! Okay. They could do whatever they want in terms of creativity. And so, similarly, they, they did make some cool choices, right? Like, they figured out some interesting stuff about game design. But they also made some clunky choices in the same way that Ocarina did. Like, I would say the lack of signposting, the lack of direction in the original Legend of Zelda is not good. I think that's actually pretty, pretty bad. Like, I tried playing it on stream. I could not find that second dungeon. I spent a long time, went over pretty much every part of the map that I could access, and I just could not get to the second part of the game. And like, it, it just says a lot about what poor conveyance it is, like using one of Aaron's own terms. Like, it was very poorly conveyed what the goal was. And yeah, the, the, the argument that he, he makes is that, you know, that's a positive thing. It's not about, you know, the things you're finding. It's about, you know, the the way there. And hey, yeah, that's what I say about art, right? It's about the process, not the actual outcome. Journey, not the destination. But if I have, if I've chosen a goal and I'm not able to accomplish it, that's frustrating. And so if if I want to get to the next part of the game, like I'm, oh, there's not that much to explore. Is is really my big problem with the original Legend of Zelda. Like running around the world, I've done it. You know, I've I've done that. It's cool or whatever, but it's not. I don't care about running around the overworld of a Zelda game. I want to get to the dungeons where the interesting design is happening. So it's. Like, yeah, it's like exploring was probably super cool when there were no other games like that, but now that we have the hindsight of everything, it's like, wow, this is very sloppy. I don't have, like, I don't want to spend a million hours just running around hoping to eventually stumble on the thing I want. I want to just go to the next thing. And maybe that's, you know, maybe that's modern design tainting my view of things. But I just, yeah, I... I think it's pretty poor design. I think it is very sloppy. That there's such poor, like, poor direction. For, like, you know, what you're supposed to do. How the fuck am I supposed to get across this? Can't even get to it half of the time. Ugh. Similarly here, it's like, I've been having a fun time, but now I'm at the point. Like, that's the thing, I think, is that... I don't know. I, I, maybe I'm being closed-minded, but my experience with games on a player side is that when there are design issues, problems in the design, um, that make it difficult to navigate or difficult to control, uh, in the early game, the challenge of that, the, the challenge of the actual gameplay is low. So I'm able to just focus on the challenge of, you know, dealing with those design issues. But as the game goes on, my God, as the game goes on, and you get to parts where the gameplay becomes more difficult, all of those things pile up, and I have less patience for all of the clunky aspects of the design. So similarly here, I'm getting very frustrated because this is an area that was not designed for this character and this movement system. 
So while they try to design a movement system that still works for the most part, it has a lot of issues. And I now, at this point in the game, where I'm having to deal with a lot of different difficulties, I'm having a lot of difficulty just doing basic tasks. Like, this area is supposed to be something of a challenge, but it's not meant to be this cha challenging. And I'm just whipped out of the flow I'm whipped out of the flow state. Because the the early challenge of the early challenge of working out the game's systems has now compounded with the late game level design. In a way that I'm very frustrated at. And also the thing is now I'm so far in that I can't just stop. I have to beat this, because if I stop and leave it for next week, it's, you know, I'm going to have to do the whole level over again. I guess, more than anything, this game does encapsulate retro gaming, for better or worse. Oh my fucking god. Because... In reality, as much as we look at it with rose-colored glasses, a lot of retro gaming was uh, not good. There are certain titles that stood out over others. But a lot of them were not great. Like, if you played the original Final Fantasy, it's not that great. It's better than some other turn-based RPGs, and the idea of a turn-based RPG was still pretty fresh, especially on console. So it was entertaining. Like, I would not call it a standout. Uh, I don't know. It, Maybe I won't remake the Fallout video just because, like, who cares about that game at this point? Like, people still talk about Ocarina, and, you know, people still care more or less about what Aaron said in that sequelitis. Fucking god. I don't know, man! I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I've tried so many different ways to do, like, a bomb bounce onto that thing and then do a bomb bounce off of it again but there's just not enough time and it's it's so frustrating and I have to do this to progress I don't know maybe I'm just like tired and hungry because I certainly am maybe that is just means I'm too overwhelmed to keep doing this but it's just like, I'm not that bad. I'm not great at games, but I'm not that bad. I'm pretty, like, I don't think that it's bragging to say that I'm pretty good at platformers. And I've shown that on this, on this stream many times. Like, I'm not the best at them, but, like, if I have a strength as a video gamer, it is platforming. So the fact that I am having this level of difficulty with it, I think does say a lot about just how absurdly difficult this is. Hold on, I'm just gonna switch to float. There we go. Oh my god. Checkpoints, please. Thank you. Switch back to this. And we will switch to that. They let airheads have airships? <laughs> Come down here, I need to borrow something. Hell, pedestrian, I was expecting the grand entrance. Substance over style, always with you scientists. So I heard the most delicious rumor. You envy my suave, daring nature, do you? Get in line. Ah, don't flatter yourself, Flyboy. Your essence is the teensiest part of my plan. 
My essence can't be taken from me, but if you ask nicely, I'd consider giving you flying lessons. Of course, my pernicious pupil. I'll have to charge. Please. <sighs> okay, we'll just come at it again from a better angle. Lost all of my money, but I don't care. At this point in the game, I hardly need it. from him. God, this sucks! Dude, what am I... Hmm. that Turn on this God I can't do shit to him man I can't do fucking anything man he moves from floor to sky to floor to sky over and over again I can't do I have to just keep changing like my types God. This fight sucks. Despite Propellonite's crude courtship rituals, I admit his vessel is romantic. A fine setting for wooing a fair mare. <sighs> By the way, I noticed Mona left a health potion among her notes. Surely it was meant for you. Take it. Cool. Incredible! The penultimate essence. Quite the accomplishment for you. I wasn't working alone, at least not in the beginning. Such humility. I realize I helped, but the credit largely goes to you. Well, anyway, the time is nigh. I'll use Mona's decanter to pick up, pack up the essences for you. Be incredibly careful with these. <sighs> Thanks, Percy. Don't wait up for me. 
You dooby kick. Okay, and then we'll go back out so we can save. Okay, we're going to finish this off next time, and then I'll have a big announcement next time. But uh, that's it for today. Ugh, so packed full of cortisol. Thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, take the time to follow and subscribe, please. Check out the Discord. I've put a lot of work into it, so I hope you have a good time. Go hang. It's a fun place, I think. There's plenty of places to share whatever you like, whether it's, you know, self-promotion or, uh... Whether it's self-promotion or it's, um... You know, somebody else's thing, other promotion, or you just saw a thing you like. Whatever you do, it's all cool. We're gonna raid over to someone, but, uh... Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll be seeing you next week. Who is, who is available? Let's see. I'm gonna go. Whoop, I'm gonna go to my end screen, and then we will find who we're gonna read over to. Oh, maybe Noreen. Noreen was having a rough time the other day, so probably enjoy a raid. trust me so let's see if obvious will let me do it sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't cool go check out go check out Noreen's stuff let her know I sent you have a great weekend I will uh I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye.